Hello, my name is Ronit Bird. I'm a specialist teacher and an author, and this is a video about dyscalculia. The reason I made this video is that it can be really quite difficult for those of us who are reasonably good with number to grasp exactly what it is that causes some people to struggle with basic arithmetic. I hope this video gives you some insight in what it might be like to have dyscalculia. I'll also be going over some of the indicators for dyscalculia, and then I'll be discussing and showing you some of the ideas that you can use, like I use with my dyscalculic pupils, to help children who struggle with maths develop a stronger and more secure sense for numbers. So, let's start by thinking about what is dyscalculia? It's a specific learning difficulty that's thought to affect roughly 5% of the population. That's about the same as the incidence of dyslexia, or any other specific learning difficulty. But whereas there is nowadays a general acceptance of dyslexia and a growing understanding of what it is and how best to deal with it, dyscalculia is not yet very well known or understood. This is beginning to change, but in terms of research or a general consensus about how best to teach children with dyscalculia, our understanding of dyscalculia is roughly 30 years behind our understanding of dyslexia. What are the symptoms or indicators of dyscalculia? There are several, and of course every individual is different, but the main indicator or symptom of dyscalculia is when someone has no feel for numbers. Let's just think about what we mean by this. If I show you this small group of glass nuggets, you'd be able to tell me exactly how many there are, even if I deliberately stop you counting them. But what about this group of nuggets, or this group? As the number of items gets larger, most of us find it more difficult to make a sensible guess. And somewhere along the line, there'll come a point when the numbers become so large that we just think to ourselves, that's a large quantity, without having any real idea of the actual magnitude or any ability to distinguish it from other large quantities. This is perfectly normal. What's different for someone with dyscalculia is that this haziness about the size of large numbers kicks in at a much earlier stage with much smaller numbers. For example, when I was working with an eight-year-old girl of normal intelligence, I wanted to explore her grasp of quantities. I showed her a group of glass nuggets just like this and asked her to estimate the number before checking the answer. The child duly made a guess, then counted the nuggets out one by one to establish that there were, in fact, 13. Immediately afterwards, I put out this group. Most of us can see at a glance that there are now at least twice as many nuggets as before. The girl, who was prevented from counting them, thought really hard before venturing that there were maybe 11. It's not that she couldn't see that the quantity had increased. Rather, this child saw an amount greater than the quantity she could mentally internalise. And for this child, and many other children I've met who struggle with maths, the words 11 and 13 were not really connected in her mind to any sense of magnitude. Try this experiment to put yourself into that child's position. Could you estimate how many hairs there are on a person's head? I wouldn't be able to choose between these options, would you? Or how many digits are there in the multi-digit number that expresses how many blades of grass are in a football pitch? I wouldn't know, because these quantities are beyond what I can visualise or really comprehend. Here's another example of how a different pupil of mine with dyscalculia revealed a difficulty in relating the size of one number to another. I asked the child specifically not to use counting to find the following answer, but to use a knowledge of doubling instead. I established that the pupil knew the answers to 1 plus 1, 2 plus 2, 3 plus 3, 4 plus 4 and 5 plus 5, before I posed this question, which was, what must I add to 4 to make 9? The pupil, a highly intelligent 9-year-old, said, could it be 5? No because, well, 5 is a much bigger number than 4, so 4 plus 5 would be much bigger than 9. This revealing answer brings us to another typical indicator for dyscalculia, a difficulty with sequencing. 
This difficulty is, of course, related to the whole issue of having very little number sense. A person who is unable to associate quantity to the words that we use for counting has no intuitive sense of the sequence of the counting numbers. Without quantities attached to the number names, the names have no meaning. They are just words or sounds. For the particular pupil I just referred to, the word five felt as if it was much further along the counting sequence than the word four, and the only way to establish where it actually comes in the sequence would be for the pupil to run through the whole sequence in order. Let's look at another significant indicator for dyscalculia, and that's the tendency to rely on counting for any and every kind of calculation. Obviously, small children learn to add and subtract by counting, and may continue to count for several years. Counting is the basis for all calculation. But children who struggle with maths tend to count in ones, often on their fingers, well beyond their early years, simply because their knowledge and understanding of numbers is so weak or insecure that they've been unable to develop better strategies. For example, a young child might add five and four by putting up five fingers on one hand and four fingers on the other, and then counting all nine of the fingers that are sticking up. At a later stage, when the child is absolutely certain that there are exactly five fingers on each hand, he might put up the fingers in the same way, but begin to count on from five to nine instead of from one to nine. Eventually, a child might automatically know the solution by recognising that every time this question is solved, it results in the same answer. It is precisely this stage of automatically just knowing the answer that a dyscalculic child has such difficulty reaching. The result is that these children get stuck at this stage of counting, a stage that Professor Eddie Gray has named the counting trap. Let's recap some of the indicators for dyscalculia that I've been talking about in this video. No feel for numbers, an inability to subitize or see even small quantities without counting, very little sense of magnitude or of relative sizes or numbers, trouble with sequencing, an over-reliance on counting in ones, an inability to memorize number facts, for example, times tables facts are notoriously difficult for dyscalculic children to remember. And there are other indicators that I haven't yet mentioned. A tendency not to notice patterns. For example, the repeating decade structure of the number system. Left-right confusion and a weakness in visual and spatial orientation. And a difficulty in reading the clock and in dealing with time and in dealing with all aspects of money. So, what can parents do to help? For specific ideas, you can go to one of the books I've published. Here, for example, is my Dyscalculia Toolkit book. I'll flick through some pages so that you can see that inside it's full of detailed instructions for practical games and activities that you can try out with your child. And at the back is a CD from which you can print off all the game boards and various resources. This yellow book is called Overcoming Difficulties with Number and is aimed at slightly older children, including adolescents. And the green book, the Dyscalculia Resource Book, is full of photocopyable games and puzzles. It's for children who've already been taught some calculation techniques that are better than counting in ones, so that they can practice these new methods. Both these books also come with CDs. I've also produced two e-books for parents. Both are for the iPad because they both contain lots of video content and I'll flick through some of these pages too. This book only deals with the numbers up to 10. It's called Exploring Numbers Through Dot Patterns and you can see it's full of illustrations and there are also more than 100 minutes of demonstration videos which you can watch full screen like this. This second ebook is called Exploring Numbers Through Quiz and Air Rods. It's got about two hours worth of short demonstration videos and it's full of lots of ideas for games and activities that are easy to set up for you to try at home. In more general terms, 
there are some overriding principles that lie behind my whole approach to working with children who struggle with maths. So here are a few of my top 10 tips for parents. First of all, we have to use the right kinds of concrete and manipulative materials and let the child play around with them, experimenting and having fun with them. The equipment that I use more than any other with dyscalculic learners is a set of Cuisinaire rods, but I also use chunky counters, base 10 blocks, dice and dominoes. Dice and dominoes are great for playing games that improve recognition of spot patterns. The idea is that if children recognise the patterns, they will not have to do so much counting. You can encourage your child to look for patterns inside patterns. For example, inside the traditional spot pattern for the number 6, one can see two threes or three twos, or the patterns of 4 and 2. Don't let your child fall into the counting trap. This is a self-perpetuating situation in which a child solves every fresh calculation by counting up or down in ones because they know so few numeracy facts for certain. To help a child out of this vicious cycle, focus on composing and decomposing small quantities into chunks, what I call components when I work with my pupils, into chunks and not into a succession of single units. Find games and activities that highlight numbers being built out of component chunks and not ones. Focus on games and activities, not on worksheets. Worksheets are dull, and a diet of worksheets is likely to demotivate your child. The best games, however, allow children to focus on one aspect of numeracy at a time, so that they can begin to construct mathematical meaning for themselves at their own rate of understanding. Games are also fun, which means that children will be motivated to keep going without even realising quite how much practice they're getting in important numeracy topics. Highlight the decimal structure of the counting system. One way to do this is to explore concrete number tracks. Another way is to build and later alter quantities on place value mats using either Cuisinaire rods or base 10 blocks. And my final tip is don't rush into abstract work. Allow your child to spend plenty of time playing around and manipulating concrete materials before anything is written down. And when you do get to the stage of writing something down, don't expect your child to record anything they haven't fully understood at the concrete level. Dyscalculic children, more than most, need to be taught for understanding. For more information, you can visit my website www.runitbird.com